For most of us, first dates can come with a whirlwind of emotions. They can make us feel nervous, excited, or even a little awkward. We might find ourselves hung up on what to wear or how we'll be perceived by the other person. We might stress over what to talk about or wonder if the other person has any glaring flaws that we don't know about yet. It isn't unusual to feel worried about how a date will go, but few people think about just how badly a date can end. Because some people go on a date and they never come back. My name is Brianne, and I'm the host and creator of Among the Dirt and Trees, a show where we explore true crime cases that occur out in nature. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the disappearance of Erin Marie Gilbert, a 24-year-old woman who went out on a date in 1995 and never made it back home. Before we jump too far in today's case, I just wanted to share some exciting news. If you follow the show on social media, you already know this, but as of this week, Among the Dirt and Trees has reached 10,000 downloads. So I'm kind of freaking out about that. (laughs) Whenever you create something, there really is no guarantee of how it will turn out. And to be quite honest, I wasn't sure how this would go at all. When I still worked in corporate America, I used to joke about starting a true crime podcast all the time. But when I finally got the chance to do it, I ended up really nervous about it. For me, the last few months have been kind of an ongoing experiment trying to figure out what podcasting is all about. And the more time that I've spent working on the show, the more new ideas and opportunities I've found along the way. The list of things that I want to do for the show is growing by the day. It is taken on a mind of its own. I can no longer control it and no productivity app can help me. I'm sure that Among the Dirt and Trees will be different in ways that even I don't know yet a year from now, but I did just want to say thank you for listening. I wasn't sure if anyone would like the premise of the show or the length or the style. It's all been one big opportunity to explore a new medium for me, and I really look forward to seeing what I can do with it. So whether you have been here since day one or you're listening for the first time, I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to my spooky nature show. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Now back to murder. At the age of 24, Erin Gilbert was in a transitional phase in her life. Roughly a year before her disappearance, she left behind San Francisco and moved in with her sister, Stephanie, who lived in Anchorage, Alaska. This change was a great thing for Erin. After time spent living with her dad, it was time for her to chase a new adventure. So she moved, and she lived on a local Air Force base with her sister. She took a job working as a nanny for a family friend, and things were going well. In fact, in June of 1995, things started to look up. While she was out at a bar with her friends, Erin met a man named David. The two hit it off quickly, and they decided to go out on a date. Fun, right? First dates can be a little awkward, even if you're really getting along with somebody. A first date can bring a lot of pressure, which is why it's so important to do something fun for your first date. It eases the tension and allows you to kind of redirect if things get a little too awkward or you run out of things to say. And if movies have taught us anything, it's that there is one date idea that never gets old. A trip to the local fair. On the evening of July 1st, Aaron and David left Anchorage behind to visit Girdwood. Girdwood is a town a little south of Anchorage that is known for a fun local staple, the Girdwood Forest Fair. Working on this case, the fair detail was of particular interest to me. I'm not sure if any of you have watched Cruel Summer on Hulu, but this show is just ruining my life. You're listening to my show, so I already know that you'll probably love it. It does deal with some pretty sensitive topics, but it is the kind of thriller that makes it nearly impossible to decide who is good and who is bad, 
And that consumes me. I can't look away from it until I know. In last week's episode, there was a huge focus on a local carnival, and it definitely made me a lot more curious about the Girdwood Forest Fair. This fair is still going on to this day, and this July, they will be celebrating the 46th annual fair. It is a community-focused event that is filled with fun, but they do have three rules. No politics, no religious orders, and, disturbingly, no dogs. From what I can tell, despite the lack of canine energy, this fair looks like a lot of fun. It is a completely free fair. They have space for camping, and they have a focus on food, art, and entertainment. More importantly, you can buy a limited edition t-shirt, and honestly, that's like half my driving force for ever going to any event, so I'm here for that. But on the night that Erin went missing, she and David went to this fair and spent some time at the beer garden. And that is the last public place that Erin was ever seen. Within a couple of short hours, the two decided that it was time to leave. There isn't any real reference for how the date was going by this point. I couldn't find any accounts regarding whether they were enjoying themselves or not, but I did find it kind of odd how quickly they decided to leave. Less than two hours after they left Aaron's home, they were already bailing on the fair. And then it got weird. If... You are anything like me, which I know a lot of my Insta true crime fam are. You're probably pretty convinced that David might not have been a knight in shining armor. After the two decided to leave the fair, they returned to David's car and the story gets more suspicious from there. According to David, when they returned to the car, his battery was dead, presumably from leaving his lights on. Now... I am not a car mechanic, and my chemistry knowledge of batteries is about eight years out now, but a battery dying that quickly seems a little weird to me. Sure, a case can be made that the battery was old and run down, and I've been there, but factoring in drive time, we're talking about a battery full-on dying in probably just a little over an hour of time? Seems extreme, but maybe that happened. When they discovered the dead battery, David had a plan. He decided that he would go to a local friend's house to get help. Being in an event that is full of people and taking this route seems weird to me, but we'll go with it. That's kind of the move that I had to keep the entire time I was reading this story because everything just got stranger with every new development. But David said that he left Aaron behind and went to go find friends. After walking for two hours in an attempt to find their house, which he apparently couldn't remember the location of, he returned, and that was when he discovered that Aaron was gone. I can be a little cynical, but I think we can all agree that this story is more than a little suspicious. And then David just made it worse. When he returned, he suddenly found that by some miracle, his car would start. The dead battery, no doubt spurred into action by what was likely a terrible date, decided to take pity on David, and his car turned on. But at this point, Aaron was already gone. David told police that he spent another couple of hours searching the fair for Aaron, but after midnight, he finally gave up. When Erin didn't come home that night and didn't call, her sister knew that something was wrong. It's just not something that she would do. And the next day, Stephanie received a call from David asking if Erin had made it home safe. Immediately, they notified the police and started the search for Erin. They went through the fairgrounds. They went through the forest. They took dogs. They took people. They went looking. But there were no clues, no sightings, and no evidence that could help police identify what happened to Aaron. So what did happen? 
everyone in true crime knows that police love to blame boyfriends and husbands when something happens to a woman, and a lot of the time they're right. But with this case, I can't help but feel like they didn't look at David hard enough. As far as I could tell, there was no real information given on how or why they cleared David. I did learn, however, that David could not be located in 2019 when Dateline started looking into the case, and I just don't know how I feel about that. (laughs) The police theory is that something happened to Erin, that she was likely abducted or murdered by presumably a stranger. When you look at pictures from the Girdwood Forest Fair, you can clearly see that it is, in fact, a forest fair. A lush green forest surrounds a venue, and it is definitely the kind of place that a person could just disappear into. You could walk into those woods and probably not walk out. Alaska is something else when it comes to missing persons cases. They have a lot, so... The woods are definitely present, but the theory that Aaron might have been abducted by someone and taken off into the woods, it does feel plausible. It's just that they didn't find any traces of her. There is a chance that while she was waiting alone, someone offered to drive her home and then ultimately kidnapped her, but the lack of evidence makes it difficult to run with this kind of theory. Really, everything that we do know about the case suggests that David might have been involved. It all just feels so wrong from start to finish. I don't trust the claim that the battery died in no time and then spontaneously fixed itself. David leaving Erin by herself instead of having her go with him also strikes me as very weird, and it just doesn't sit right given what we know. Why were these two leaving the event so early? Was the date going bad and they just decided to part ways? Was it just too awkward for David to drag her to go find his friend's house because his car battery died? You know, was he embarrassed or something? I'm not saying that it isn't possible, but nothing about the story feels real to me. The dead battery, the inability to locate his friend's house and hours just spent walking, then leaving her alone while she walked off, it all feels like a poorly pieced together story. And I'm just not sure that I buy it. I don't know why the police cleared David, but I have to wonder if there was some other side to all of this that we're not getting. It seems possible that the date was going badly and that Aaron expressed an interest in leaving, and maybe David didn't like that. Maybe the hours that he spent looking for some random house and combing the forest fair were actually spent abducting or harming Aaron in some way. And maybe it was spent disposing of evidence or moving her to a new location where he knew that police wouldn't be looking. I know that it's dangerous to speculate and point fingers, but I'm just not convinced with what is publicly available from this case. To me, it feels like David is either very unlucky, or he knows more than he's telling the police. I did some researching, and in all the pictures that I've seen from the festival, I don't see a ton of space. While there is the surrounding forest, and there are plenty of places to wander, the fair itself doesn't look like the kind of place that you would spend hours walking through without finding someone or realizing that they were gone. I'm not a cop, but it is my not at all an expert opinion that there is just more to the story than we have been given. Even though Erin has been missing for multiple decades at this point, her family still has questions about her disappearance and they're still looking for answers. Something that shook me about the story was actually presented in a Dateline interview with her sister. Stephanie told Dateline that on the night of the date, her son, Aaron's nephew, who was only four years old, told Aaron to take a cell phone, and Aaron said she didn't need one. Not only is this sad knowing how the night went, but it's also not the first time that I've heard this kind of story. I've come across a lot of true crime cases and interviews where family members 
especially young kids, say something that seems incredibly insightful after something terrible has happened. But for the family, I have to assume that the memory just hits really hard. We still don't know what happened to Erin, and her family wants answers that they will probably never get. And that's terrible. Dating can be fun, but it can also be dangerous. You never truly know what someone's intentions are, especially if they're a stranger. These days, we live in an era of internet dating, and that can be a beautiful thing. You can meet someone who you never would have met otherwise, but there's always a risk that comes with it. I just talked with some people on Instagram this week about the importance of tools like Find My Phone when you go on a date with someone that you don't know, and it really is important. You know, if you have an iPhone, you can share your location for the night with a friend so somebody always knows where you are. If you're in danger, you can press the lock button five times to enter emergency mode and call the police. It will share your location. It will send a message to an emergency contact. And it really can save your life if you're in a bad situation. It's something that you can very discreetly do if something starts to go south. Android phone users, I couldn't find an equivalent other than the emergency mode that helps your phone to save on battery life in an emergency situation. So... I have to advise that you hop on over to a forum of people who know Android better, or to the Google Play Store for a helpful app, or just get an iPhone so my information is actually useful to you. Either way, you can never be too safe, and people suck. So, be careful out there. In the event that you want to talk true crime, dating safety, or you just want to read the ridiculous amount of true crime content that I'm dumping into the internet, feel free to check out the show's social media using the tag at datpod on Instagram or Twitter. And if you're over ads or you just want to join the community discord so you can talk true crime all day with me, feel free to become a patron at patreon.com slash like and inscribe. Thanks, guys. Stay safe out there. (laughs) 